Hello everyone, uh, welcome to another session in uh, nonlinear control. Um, <clears throat> so we were looking at some preliminary material um, since last time. And <clears throat> so some of this, I mean, we didn't of course cover this material. We were looking at a few <clears throat> myths and temptations in nonlinear control. Uh, this was sort of one of the first things that we looked at basically uh, meaning to say that um, the function convergence doesn't mean the derivative convergence and the derivative convergence doesn't mean the function convergence and so on. All right. Uh, this was sort of the first thing that we did. Uh, and then we moved on to some preliminary material on vector and matrix norms. Yeah. So obviously we started with the vector norms. So if you have a fixed vector, then you can define these <coughs> infinity norm or any p norm in this way yeah and uh, using these vector norms we can in fact uh, graduate over to uh, you know matrix induced norms as well so the matrix induced norm is defined using the supremum and the vector norms right and <clears throat> of course there are also you know simpler uh, formulae in some sense for computing these right so so uh, we actually saw that there are these, uh, you know, simple expressions for this induced norms, right? Of course, we have the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality on the induced norms. <clears throat> we have these um, very simplified expressions for the infinity one and two uh, matrix induced norm, right? Otherwise, it would be rather difficult to compute the supremum and so on, right? So we also looked at some properties of symmetric matrices. <clears throat> And um, yeah, in general, we looked at the notions of what is a normed linear space. So some, some more abstract content is what we discussed. Uh, so these were ideas on what is the notion of a, um, you know, a, a vector space or a linear space having a norm, um, essentially a notion of uh, length, if you may. And of course the uh, we also showed proof uh, you know but well, we saw a little bit of the proof of uh, you know when when these uh, particular norms that are defined actually satisfy the norm properties right uh, primarily the triangle inequality because the rest of the properties are relatively easy to verify right and we saw those as well right and then we looked at <clears throat> what is the notion of you know convergence and Cauchy sequence and so on and this led us to notions of uh, you know complete non-linear space right so what is the meaning of a, uh, so there is a vector space and then there is the epithet that is a um, normed linear space or normed vector space and then there is uh, the idea of a complete uh, normed linear space right? and that's what is called a Banach space Essentially, in such spaces, the notions of convergence and Cauchy convergence become identical, right? Um, we, again, we saw examples, I mean, in Rn, which is the sort of vector space that we deal with uh, for most of this course, um, of course, is a Banach space, right? So we also saw uh, a more advanced notion of inner product space. So we looked at non-linear space, which is uh, the idea of norm, which is the idea of a length, uh, for vector spaces, for general vector spaces. And then uh, one's also interested in operation between vectors, right? So how does one vector operate on the other? So that's uh, one particular operation that's defined is an inner product, right? And so a vector space that is um, uh, a normed um, uh, space, or in fact, you don't necessarily have to norm, but anyway, the normed uh, vector space, if it's endowed with an inner product, is called an inner product space right and of course the inner product also has a few properties it has a symmetry property distributivity property scalar multiplication property and the fact that um, the inner product of the vector with itself is non-negative and zero only if the vector itself is zero right so <clears throat> then just like the you know normal linear space we looked at the completeness we are also interested in the completeness of the inner product space and that's the 
idea of a Hilbert space. So what we say is that an inner product space, which is complete with the associated norm, right? It's evident that if I'm given an inner product, then if I operate, if in the inner, the inner product takes two vectors, as you can see. So if I put in the same vectors, right? X comma X, then I get a norm, right? It can be shown that this is in fact a norm, right? And so the idea is that if the vector space is in fact complete uh, with this particular norm that's generated from the inner product, then what we have is called a Hilbert space, right? Again, as always, Rn is an obvious example, right? So <clears throat> once we looked at this, uh, we wanted to look at signal norms. Uh, we sort of went over this um, in not so much detail. And so that is the first thing we want to do today is that we want to look at the signal norms in a, a little bit more detail, all right? So what is a signal norm? See, until now we've been looking at vector norms and matrix norms, right? Signal norm is also a norm that's defined on a vector space, right? So, but the only difference is we are now talking about a vector signal, which means that it's a map from time to Rn, right? And that's what most of the states that we will be looking at subsequently are, right? Eventually, once you solve a nonlinear differential equation, what you get is a function of time, right? And it's typically a vector function of time, right? Because you will have multiple states, right? You will have more than one state. So you typically have a vector function of time, right? And uh, so what we then do is we define these uh, signal norms, right? So the P signal norm, which is denoted in this way, right? Um, is defined using the vector norm. Yeah, please note that the vector norm contains the time argument, right? Because it has to, because the vector is, the vector norms are for fixed vectors. So until I fix a time t, x of t is not a fixed value, right? So therefore, in order to evaluate a vector norm, I will need to specify the time. Therefore, whenever I'm talking about a vector norm of a signal of a time varying quantity, I will have the time argument in here, right? It's almost like saying that I have a signal and I'm looking at the value at some particular time, right? So that's the idea. So using this vector norm and note that this is arbitrary vector norm. We didn't say that it's the one norm, two norm, infinity norm or anything because you see no subscript here, right? So this is flexible, right? So we take this vector norm, uh, take, its, uh, take its power uh, to the power p and integrate from zero to infinity over time and then take one over p, right? That's what is the p signal norm, yeah? p signal norm. Similarly, we have the uh, infinity norm, which is defined slightly differently using the supremum. It just says supremum over all time greater than or equal to zero norm vector norm of xt, okay? Now, uh, as I said, the vector norm used is arbitrary, but typically um, for a single problem, uh, for evaluating a single particular problem or a control question, you would always use the same vector norm for all the vectors you have, okay? Um, otherwise, you will end up getting really ridiculous results, yeah? So it's important that you're consistent, you use the same vector norm everywhere, but the choice of that particular vector norm that you use for the entire problem is completely free, yeah? You are free to choose which vector norm you want to use, okay? Great. Now, um, so, so obviously the that's what we are saying here. The choice of the vector norm is not matter, doesn't matter, but do not switch. So be consistent throughout the problem. Right? Now, one of the important things that we define here is that if a particular signal norm is finite for any given p from one to infinity, then we say that x belongs to this capital this script L p space. Okay, this is a very large class of functions. Uh, which is called the LP class of functions, okay? And these are very important classes. They appear everywhere in uh, analysis, uh, Fourier series. Uh, these are essentially some kind of advanced integrability type conditions, right? Because as you can see, each of these norms is defined using integral of some power of the vector norm, right? So these are like integrability conditions. So if you take P equal to one, this looks like classic integrability condition, but if you take P equal to two and so on, they're just, advanced versions of the same integrability condition okay so please remember that these are these these, these define a very very large class of functions 
right? and very very large and very very useful class of functions okay so one of the important things that we realize immediately is that the when we say that x belongs to l infinity we are just referring to a bounded signal why because the infinity norm is just defined by the supremum over all time yeah so it's easy to see uh, easy to prove something like this how do we go about it if x is bounded if x of t is bounded for all time it, it means that there exists some constant m such that the vector norm of x for a particular time t is always less than or equal to m for all t and this is true this holds for all t right if you fix a time then the vector norm xt is always going to be less than or equal to m okay all right. again this m may vary depending on which vector norm you chose but there exists such an m so we don't have to worry because we are going to be consistent we're going to use the same vector norm all the time all right great now once you know that the vector norm x of t is less than or equal to m for all t the supremum also has to be less than or equal to m because if 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 at every instant in time i evaluate the vector norm and it's less than or equal to m then the supremum also has to be less than or equal to m right because supremum is nothing but the least upper bound right so i'm saying m is an upper bound for all time therefore m also has to upper bound to supremum right which means that there is a bound on the supremum norm or the infinity norm therefore x belongs to l infinity right sub so, uh, you know um, looking at the other side of the argument if the function you know if, if i say that the infinity norm is in fact equal to m right uh, then i know that supremum is equal to m right which means for all time um, the vector norm x of t is going to be less than or equal to m because again um, infinity norm or supremum essentially is the least upper bound so it is in fact an upper bound whether it be the least or the largest it doesn't matter but it's an upper bound for the signal therefore this upper bound will always hold and this indicates that the signal is a bounded signal all right so it's a very easy proof right it and you can claim that the signal is a bounded signal right so like i said the lp space appears in quite a few places in mathematics right um anyway so so lp uh, typically the lp can be seen as a regularity condition yeah uh, and will typically appear in several convergence type results yeah that you will see and small lp is a discrete counterpart so if you have uh not a continuous function of time like we are using right but a discrete function of time that you you just have the function value at step 1 step 2 step 3 step 4 and all that then and, and so you use, use summations instead of integration then you have the small lps right? and the same notions apply there as well right now as far as the notation goes let's be careful the vector norm like i said it's frozen in time signal right because the vector norm can only only be uh, evaluated if your uh, function is fixed right so therefore uh, the vector norm right uh, will always contain the time argument in there right it's a time frozen quantity yeah? on the other hand the signal norm if you notice either i take a supremum over all time or it take an integral over all time right which means that the time argument goes away vanishes from this quantity therefore in the left hand side there can be no time argument yeah it would be ridiculous to say that it xt uh, norm of p right so therefore the signal norms will always have no time argument just something like this and a subscript maybe okay now one of the things that we sort of know about vector norms is this notion of a uh, norm equivalence yeah for vector norms we have this very very nice result which essentially says that if you take any two vector norms they are comparable by a constant okay what does it mean if i take the q norm uh, then i can always find constants alpha beta such that i can compare it with the p norm like this i can bound it on both sides with the p norm with using constants alpha and beta okay now you can see i can always flip this argument right i can always say that x is greater than or equal to 1 by beta uh xp is greater than or equal to 1 by beta xq and similarly x is less than 1 by alpha xq therefore the p norm can also be bounded on both sides with the q norm right 
so this norm equivalence is very standard um, and holds for vector norms however uh, such an equivalence is not possible for signal norms okay this in short sort of means that if i take any signal that is uh, any any vector function of time then there is no guarantee that if it is belonging to an l1 space that it will belong to l2 space or if it's in infinity space it will belong to l1 l2 space <clears throat> there is no such guarantee right so these are completely distinct class of functions in general is what it means yeah and where does the problem come because you are sort of trying to integrate over all time or you know trying to take supremum over all time this is this is where the problem arises and let's see some examples of this yeah? so the first very very standard example is this function vector function xt is cosine t sine t right and <clears throat> what is the infinity norm so i'm going to take it's my choice what vector norm i choose i choose to take the two norm because you can see that the two norm is very easy to compute in this case right so so the infinity norm is just supremum of the two norm over all time right and what's the two norm it's just one okay so the supremum is actually equal to one right the supremum is actually equal to one as you can see here right now this means that the supremum is bounded therefore the infinity norm exists yeah therefore x belongs to l infinity as per our definition right if a function has a has a finite lp norm then it belongs to the lp space right it has a finite infinity norm therefore it belongs to l infinity space yes now let's evaluate the one norm or the you know x1 how will it look like in this case instead of taking the supremum you're just integrating from zero to infinity and this quantity is still one because nothing has changed i've still taken the two vector norm right i've chosen to take the two vector norm i'm choosing to be consistent right therefore the two vector norm still evaluates to one however now if i integrate this one from zero to infinity then i get infinity right therefore the one norm is not finite anymore therefore x does not belong to l1 right so therefore there's no way you can propose any kind of non equivalence like this because one quantity is finite another quantity is infinite right therefore there is no way there can be any equivalence right because there can be no such constants relating a finite quantity and an infinite quantity right there there exists no such constants right so it's pretty obvious that uh signal norms are slightly uh, more evolved or involved notions uh, where uh, this sort of a uh <clears throat> norm equivalence kind of things don't hold okay so the only thing the norm equivalence basically says for these kind of examples is that you know instead of the two norm uh, if i had chosen some other norm say some uh, five norm or three norm nothing would have changed the constant would have changed a little bit that's it right there's a constant here would have changed that's it and that's all we are saying with norm equivalence here yeah it did not it doesn't mean that this would not be infinity so it still have been infinity okay all right so let's look at some other examples i mean we just looked at an example where a function is bounded or l infinity but not l1 uh what about the other cases what what about a function which is l2 and not l1 so this is one such example where a function is f of x is defined as 1 over x for all x greater than or equal to 1 and 0 otherwise so let's evaluate i mean this is a scalar function so there is no choice of vector norm or anything like that the norm is just the absolute value so what is the l2 norm so if i want to say that i want to compute the two norm then i will just have 0 to infinity uh, f of x absolute value squared to the power half okay and what is f of x squared so this will actually reduce to what this will just be um 1 to infinity 1 by x squared dx to the power half and you already know this is nice it's minus 1 by x right this is just minus 1 by x uh, evaluated from at 1 and infinity and to the power half and this is basically 
yeah so the two norm is just one right what about the one norm what about the one norm this is a problem right so the only difference that will happen is that this will become one to infinity one by x dx all right and this is a problem why because this is going to be log x from one to infinity right and this is infinite okay so therefore this is not right so f is not in l1 okay i hope that's evident okay similarly you have another example which is where um, you have this just a second just remove this so we have a clean place to write all right so yeah so this is a case where you have a function f which is in l1 but not in l2 right so actually this should be the other way around Just a second. I will fix this. L one, not an L two. Okay. So, again, not difficult to evaluate. I guess right, that this function is L one, not an L two. Um, again, you integrate for the one norm. You are going to just do zero to infinity, uh, and you have f. uh going from right and this will actually reduce to this is 0 to 1 right uh interesting thing is this is only from uh this is not actually at 0 but at 1 okay but we'll still do this integral like this so this is just 1 over square root of x dx okay uh and this will become uh i believe this will become 2 square root of x 0 to 1 this is going to become 2 right uh yeah i think that should be fine yeah Think that should be fine. Anyway, we can check. It's just this factor of two that you have to check. But otherwise, I think this is fine. Yeah. Um. And if I do the f two, now what happens? It's zero to one, one over x dx to the power half. And again, ah, uh, this will land you in trouble because this will become log of x zero to one. Yeah. and the problem is at x equal to 0 this is undefined right it's minus infinity right so this is again going to uh, go to infinity all right so that's a problem again all right so that's not uh, so these are these are some nice examples right that that works for one space right it's in l1 or not in l2 l2 not in l1 l infinity not in any lp any other lp and so on yeah so you can you can create many such counter examples right so basically to indicate that norm equivalence does not hold in general right so in in signal uh in the case of signal norms and expected right not uh since we are talking about general much more general norms right so what <clears throat> i wanted to look at is uh, since we have looked at so much of the norms um we have looked at non linear spaces uh we have looked at uh the idea of uh, the fact that the norms follow triangle inequality obviously one of the key properties of norms is triangle inequality but one of the other properties uh, and then you also saw it for the matrix norms is this sort of cauchy schwarz type of an inequality that the norms uh, really follow yeah so so this cauchy schwarz inequality of course we stated it without any proof here for the matrix case 
but i wanted to work out a, a simple proof of a cauchy schwarz inequality for the general case right so so this is the notation that that you have two vectors x and y which belong to a normed linear space so there is a vector space x and there is an inner product sorry in fact it's not a normed linear space it's an inner product space right and the inner product and this is in fact the cauchy schwarz inequality that we want to prove right for the matrix case you already seen uh, that and this is the more general one right so this is a very nice nifty simple proof so if you take any vector u uh, it can be uh, written as these two components that is a component in a direction of some vector v and something orthogonal to that right so how do you get the component along v you just take the inner product and divide it by norm v squared right so essentially it's it's the inner product is seen as a projection right the inner product is seen as a projection and then you have some vector w which is um, orthogonal right which is orthogonal to v right uh, so so you can always break any vector in these two components if you may okay in these two components a component in the direction of any arbitrary vector v and something that's orthogonal to it right we are not even saying that this is um you know we are not trying to even define what this is um you know more explicitly because we don't need it right now if i take the inner product of u with itself right uh then um you can you can just write this formula again right so basically this is u so i just repeat the same thing here and then i expand it right using the inner product ideas right how inner product works right so from the first two i will have uv over norm v square whole squared right basically this multiplied by this and then i'll have a v inner product with v right? and then i will have a mixed term which is twice uv divided by norm v squared uh, i believe this should be norm v squared right because of the yeah it should be norm v squared and then there will be a v uh, inner product with w and then you have a w in a product with w as the last term right so now anyway we are not too uh, concerned about uh, you know what this is going to look like and so on uh, this this last term but we know that this guy is going to zero because they are orthogonal right uh, remember that i could have expanded this term very easily as well right if i if i simply say uh, i mean if i instead of uh, w i use a you know w bar and and then i say that i take right so this would be this term right instead of w i could have simply written this term but the point is that uh u and w are still orthogonal okay so that would have still been the case uh, sorry sorry not u and w but v and w are still orthogonal right and that that would have still boiled down to the same expression so that's why we are not expanding but we could have if you wanted to right all right great so so basically using the fact that any vector can be uh, written in components of an, a vector v and something orthogonal to it okay and this orthogonality is being defined by the inner product okay is defined by the inner product that's it i mean it's not necessarily 90 degrees or anything like that it's being defined by the inner product yeah you may choose some funny inner product because for which it is not 90 degrees right now once we have that we know that this is a non negative quantity it's a norm omega squared a norm w squared similarly this is norm v squared right and this norm v squared will con cancel with this norm v to the power 4 to so i am left with norm v squared this quantity is greater than equal to 0 so what do i know i know that u square is in fact greater than equal to just the first term right and i immediately get the cauchy schwarz inequality yeah exactly as i wanted right in fact in rn you can do something even simpler you have this triangle inequality right from the typical norm in rn and then you just expand both sides right just you take a square basically you take a square and then you expand this side you get this on the left hand side you have a norm u plus v square which is basically this quantity in an inner product space yeah you are using the norm that is being induced by the inner product right and so you get what u u inner product of u u inner product of v v plus twice u v 
right? And so this guy cancels with this guy, this guy cancels with this guy, and so I'm left with, and the two cancels out here, and so I'm left with uv less than or equal to norm u times norm v, all right? So this is how you would prove the um, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality in general, right? Great.